In .NET 8, we have a unified Blazor web app project type that allows us to utilize components that run on Blazor server, Blazor WebAssembly, or even Auto, which progresses from server to WebAssembly. We even have the opportunity to not use either interaction type if we want mostly static server-side rendered pages. However, you may have noticed that we still have a Blazor WebAssembly standalone project type. If the new Blazor web app project type is so great, why do we still have the old project type? In this video, we're going to look at the Blazor WebAssembly standalone project type, including what it does and why it's still very valuable to have this project type. I highly recommend that you understand this project type and where it is valuable. Now, before we dive in, I want to share a few things with you. First, if you're interested in improving your C Sharp skills, be sure to subscribe to this channel. With over 700 C Sharp videos and counting, it's the perfect place to learn and grow your skills. Second, if you're looking for free C Sharp resources, head over to imtimcorey.com and check out the resources tab. You'll find a podcast, C Sharp projects page, and much more. Third, if you're ready for a deeper dive into a specific C Sharp topic, I have a variety of courses that can help. Not only will you receive a world-class education, but you'll also help fund my free content so that everyone can have a great education in C-sharp, not just those who can afford it. So let's jump over to Visual Studio and we're going to create a new project type. And for this, we're going to search for Blazor. And notice we here we have the Blazor web app, but also the Blazor WebAssembly standalone app. This is what we're going to choose. It's a Blazor WebAssembly standalone app. Hit next. Let's call this the uh, Blazor WASM demo. WASM stands for Web Assembly. We'll put this in our practice projects and we'll call this Blazor WASM demo app. Hit next. We're going to use .NET 8, which is the current LTS version. .NET 9 is coming out around the corner. Don't worry, um, this will still work. So authentication type none, we're going to configure for HTTPS. We are going to check the box that says progressive web application. This is the kind of the big deal about Blazor WebAssembly and one of the real big benefits of having this project type. So a progressive web app is a web application that you can install directly onto a device. So it still runs the browser, but it all runs locally, which means essentially you can have something very, very close to a, a installed application, but yeah, it's a web application that can be updated from the web and it can be deployed to almost any device. So really big benefits to have a progressive web app. And if you're looking at, you know, the idea of having a, uh, a mobile app for your, your, your company or, or for your project, this might be the place to start. Now you may decide you want to have a fully installed, uh, fully native built web app or uh, application, you know, so native to iOS or Android, but this is a great place to get started. And it's a great place to maybe even be done. Like this might be all you need. It's very easy to distribute. You can actually put them in the app stores now they will install an icon just like any other application. They can work offline and so many other things. So this is the big reason why we still have the Blazor WebAssembly standalone app type. Because only WebAssembly is fully client side. So we want this to be checked. If we don't check it, we can add stuff later, but this will add a few things. I want to show you what those are. So next up, we're going to include the sample pages just so we have something. We're not going to disable top level statements and we're not going to add Aspire orchestration. We hit create. And now this is our project type. And if I hit run, just right in the box, get this running. Um, let's wait for it to start. And Sometimes it does this. I've noticed this with, with Visual Studio. You'll get an about blank and it won't actually start. You can start it by going over to your command window and just running this um, URL. But the other thing you can do is just close this out and restart it. 
and it will launch properly. So just so you know. So this is our Blazor WebAssembly project type application. Now let's go to counter. The counter works like normal. There's a weather app. Now the weather app doesn't have um, uniquely generated value of notices from 2022. Um, so if you come back over here, it's still that same value and the temperature is still the same values, even if you come back to it. But the counter does work, you know, so you can do rich client side interactivity, but the big deal here is this is a progressive web application so that if you click this little icon right here, it says, hey, install the Blazor Web Wasm demo app and it will install using this icon. It will put the icon on your desktop. It will allow you to launch this application. It will be in your um, apps and features list so you can actually uninstall it from the uninstaller. Um, all these things can be done by just clicking the install button. Now we're not gonna do that, but just so you know, you can do that. And that's what a progressive web application is. Now, there are a few things to note when you're talking about a progressive web application. So first of all, let's look at what the various parts of this application are. So we have pages like normal, home, counter, weather. We have our program.cs with you know, all our services and the build. This is pretty standard stuff, although one of the things you'll notice is there's not a, a data access or other type of demo like that in a Blazor WebAssembly project. The reason why is because Blazor WebAssembly runs fully on the client side. What that means is that the client side has access to your source code. And that might sound scary. And in some ways it could be, except for the fact that this is how the web works. You know, when you build a, a JavaScript application or Angular, React, or Vue, you're sending all of your source code to the client. This is how the web works. If it's a fully client side application, then the client side has the source code. Now, the way it gets built, the way it gets sent down, it's a little harder to read the source code, but it's still there. So when it comes to things like data access, you do not want to have direct data access to SQL or other things, and that's by default turned off and disabled. Because if they had direct access to SQL, well, then your client could access SQL directly too, and that wouldn't be good. So you can't have user secrets because if you had secrets in here, well, then the client can, can read those secrets. They're not secret anymore. They're just public information. So yes, you can add an app settings.json, but it's not one by default because the fact that, yes, those are all readable by the client. And so you may say, well, then how is this product type of, of any value? Well, the reason why is because it can talk through APIs, just like Angular, React, or Vue do. This is how they work, and this is how this works as well, is that you talk through APIs, and the API accesses the database or other secure resources and can do so behind that, that layer of protection. So just note when you ask things like, well, how do I access uh, MySQL or, or Microsoft SQL? My answer is going to be don't access an API, okay? There are storage capabilities, but that would be storage for things like caching or for, you know, storing locally on the device that is, is not information that's sensitive or information that's, that's for that user, but it's not something that you would want, um, or, or need to have secured and encrypted. And yes, the question is gonna come up, what if I encrypt things? Well, encryption is only uh, valuable for people in the outside, okay? So if you control one end of encryption where you encrypt it or decrypt it, well, then you have access to that raw data either way. So that's why you can't just encrypt values here because they have to be decrypted on this side, which would mean you have to have the ability to decrypt the values and see them clear text, which would mean so the client. Okay, so this looks like a normal Blazor project. It's not quite as complicated as the Blazor web app project type, but it is still a Blazor application. It should look fairly normal to you. This is fairly normal stuff. So where is the differences? Like we have the, the main layout, the nav layout, 
This is all pretty standard stuff. Well, where we get the differences is we go to www root and we look at a few things here. So first off, we see we have an index.html. This is what actually launches our application. And notice we're using this JavaScript here, blazor.webassembly.js, as well as registering a service worker. The service worker is where the, the offline happens and other things that, that you might want to have act, happen for your application. The manifest, the manifest.webmanifest is where we have information about our application that's used for installation. So we have the name, the short name, the ID, we have the start URL, we can leave these two alone. Um, display, stand alone, leave it alone as well, but then we have the background color, we have a theme color, and we have some icons. So you can change these things to use your own icon. Notice that the icon it uses is, if I hover over this, the, the blazer icon, that's the default icon. But you can put your own icons in here, you can um, change up things like the background color or the theme color, or the name of your application. This is how you customize it so that the installer is, you know, looks like what you expect it to, to be real, you know, to be a real application. This is where you change things like, you know, this is, you know, Tim's cool application. Um, that way the user knows, oh, that's what I'm installing, not just a demo, but I'm installing Tim's cool application. So that's the, the web manifest. Let's look at the service worker. The service worker is empty. So if you notice here, and there's it, the text scrolls, I can um, minimize this. So in development, always fetch in the network and do not enable offline support, okay? So what this is saying is that when you are running in development mode, it's always going to be the online only version. There is no offline support. You may say, well, Tim, a progressive web application, that's one of the big values is to have offline support. And that's true, but not for in development mode. And the reason for that is because if you enabled offline support for development, well, when you ran your application, it would run the old version first, which would mean if you made changes and go and test them, the test wouldn't work because it hasn't lowered the new values yet. You have to wait until in the background, those new values were downloaded and then restart the application and try again. And then you would see your changes. That'd be a very frustrating process and not one you wanna go through. So by default, we have no offline support for de in development mode. However, if you notice over here, the dropdown, there's also serviceworker.published.js when you publish your application, this is what works offline. So for instance, we have offline assets included. There's DLLs, PDBs, WASMs, HTML, JavaScript, JSON, CSS, ping files, JPEG files, and many more. If you decide to add more files, you could add more files to this list. But this service worker will allow your application to work offline. So all this information, for the most part, you don't have to change much of it, if anything. But if you wanted to change, for example, which offline files are available or excluded, that's how you do it. But this way, you'll make sure that your application works in offline mode when it's published, not when it's in development mode, but when it's published. So you might want to publish it to, let's say, a, a Docker container locally in order to test the offline capabilities while at the same time doing development with online only or something like that. So this is for your uh, benefit that it doesn't work offline by default in development, but you can change that if you want or just publish it to your local IIS or publish it to a Docker container and then you're good to go. So with that, that's the big difference with Blazor WebAssembly, but Blazor WebAssembly, again, it works fully offline. It works using WebAssembly, which is a internet standard thing of, that, that isn't about Microsoft. It's not Microsoft's thing. It's a, uh, a web standard that Microsoft then utilizes to take C Sharp code and run it in your, in your browser locally on the client side. So 
Again, this whole application gets downloaded. Once it gets downloaded, it gets cached, and then you can also work offline. In the future, I'm going to show you how to do things like store things in local storage, other things that will really turn this into a really great application type for certain circumstances. Not every web application needs to work offline, but there are a lot of cases where web application working offline really turns it into a, a valuable, valuable tool for organizations to build a, an app like project type that's very cheap to do and yet is very, very powerful. So we'll see that in the future. But for now, this is the WebAssembly product type. This is different than Blazor web apps. Blazor web apps do have WebAssembly components or even pages, but that's not the same thing as the offline capable progressive web application type that Blazor WebAssembly standalone is the only one that can do. So that's the difference, but I would encourage you to try us out, play with it, work with it, and just see how this works because this can be a really valuable thing for your organization to understand how to use. All right, thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.